packed agenda for today, so we want to get right into it. Um, I'm Sarah Hawley. I'm the faculty lead for the Education and Training Work Group here within IHPI, and we are just thrilled today to be having a unique presentation with our Early Career Faculty Spotlight featuring two of our outstanding Early Career members um, jointly presenting today, um, each presenting a briefer presentation about their own work um, and hopefully having some time to discuss and ask questions. Um, so how we're going to do this is I'm going to give a brief introduction of each of our faculty speakers. Uh, then we'll turn it over to the first speaker, hopefully have a little bit of time for questions, turn it over to the second speaker and have a little bit of time for questions, and then maybe even have some joint time at the end. Uh, we will be having the breakout rooms afterwards for those of you who want to remain on for 10 or 15 minutes um, after th three o'clock, please feel free to do that. And also feel free to put your questions in the chat and I'll monitor that. Um, so that they're ready to go uh, for the speakers when they conclude. Um, and so with that, we're just, again, we're thrilled to have our two early career faculty members presenting today. Dr. Maria Papaliento is an assistant professor of internal medicine uh, with an appointment in the Division of Metabolism, Endoc Endocrinology, and Diabetes, uh, or MEND. She's also a research assistant professor at the Institute of Gerontology. Her clinical practice focuses on thyroid disease and thyroid cancer, as well as geriatric endocrinology. And her research focuses on evaluating the risks of thyroid hormone overtreatment and misuse in adults, which she'll be talking a bit about with us today. We also have Dr. Wu, who's an assistant professor of family medicine and OBGYN here at the University of Michigan. She is a family physician and completed a family planning fellowship and master of public health. Um, her overall career mission, which she's going to talk to us about today, is to improve reproductive health equity through person-centered and justice-informed research and research practices. Her research also focuses on contraceptive and epidemiology and contraceptive behavioral interventions. Um, and we're super excited to have both of them speaking with us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Maria, um, and I will track your time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction, and thank you for the invitation to present some of our team's work today. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures, uh, but I just did want to mention that I was recently appointed as co-chair for the upcoming revised hypothyroidism guidelines from the American Thyroid Association, and I also served as a reviewer for the 2023 American Geriatric Society uh, Beers Criteria List which uh, comprises of a list of potentially inappropriate medications in older adults. So I'm gonna try to be as concise as possible uh, and present some of the background that informed my research, uh, mainly data on thyroid hormone use and misuse uh, in the United States and uh, globally. Uh, moving on to whether uh, we should worry about risks of both over and under replacement with thyroid hormone, and what are some of the factors that may influence our decision making as uh, physician prescribers of thyroid hormone management, particularly as it pertains to older adults. And then I'll end up with one slide uh, describing some of the future directions. So in keeping with my, my long Greek name and my Greek roots, uh, I'd like to start uh, by some quotes from Hippocrates, who is the father of medicine, uh, who encompasses really um, the main theme of our research team, which is to reduce low value care and particularly in vulnerable populations such as older adults. So the physician must be able to tell the antecedents, know the present and foretell the future must mediate these things and have two special objects in view with regard to disease, namely to do good or to do no harm. And some of the other quotes underneath also display what I wanna talk about today as to diseases, make a habit or two of things, of two things to help or at least to do no harm. Everything in excess is opposed by nature and the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. So for those of you who may not be taking care of patients, uh, I just wanted to bring this up, uh, which uh, I started getting interested about this when I, uh, to my surprise, found out several years ago that levothyroxine, which is the synthetic form of thyroid hormone, uh, ranked first in terms of a number of prescriptions in the United States for several years. And you can see here, uh, even with our most recent data in 2020, 
uh, levothyroxine actually still in the top three medications competing with medications such as antihypertensive, cholesterol medications, and narcotics. On the right, you can see kind of the trends of thyroid hormone use in the United States. Uh, in panel A, uh, you can see over time that there's been an increase uh, use of thyroid hormone. And uh, in panel B, you can see the, um, uh, the ones that are uh, most affected by this. So thyroid hormone users are more likely to be women um, and uh, uh, older adults. And this uh, thyroid hormone use has increased over time. Uh, the other thing to mention is that once patients are studied on thyroid hormone, data has shown that it's continued lifelong in about 90% of patients. It's particularly uh, worrisome that thyroid hormone use is actually uh, most commonly initiated in older adults. And these are data from a population-based study of 6,000 adults age 65 and older from the cardiovascular health study uh, that showed that over time, again, uh, from data collected between 1989 and 2006, that uh, thyroid hormone initi initiation rates increased uh, over time, and again, as you can see in women uh, and whites. But what was more worrisome in this study was that the initiation rate was nonlinear with age, with patients who are 85 years and older being more than twice as likely to have thyroid hormone initiated compared to those that are 65 to 69, and this was independent of sex and race. Uh, and again, for those of you who are not familiar with thyroid hormone, uh, thyroid hormone is unique uh, compared to other medications because we have a bio biochemical marker uh, where we can determine disease, but also in patients who are replaced, determine over and under treatment. And that marker is thyroid stimulating hormone or, or TSH. This is a hormone that's released by the pituitary gland and traditionally used uh, as blood work uh, monitoring people. But this data from NHANES uh, that looked at uh, populations across different age strata showed that in patients who don't have any known underlying thyroid disease, there seems to be a shift in the distribution curve uh, of this number to the right, uh, both in the median TSH and also the 97.5 center, which is typically used as the upper limit of normal in a range. Uh, and this may suggest that an, a mildly elevated TSH, which with our current ranges may indicate an underactive thyroid, may actually not be that and be a normal manifestation of aging. So the question in you know, the thyroid world is, are we overestimating maybe some subclinical disease and initiating thyroid hormone in all these older adults when we shouldn't be? Uh, are we causing harm when we do that? And should we really be using age-specific ranges? The other um, interesting data is that when you look at comparisons between centenarians and controls, you see a similar shift with other studies also show that showing that um, a higher TSH may be associated with longevity. So initiating thyroid hormone inappropriately in these people may also actually interfere with an adaptive mechanism to prevent catabolism. There's different postulations as to why thyroid hormone use has increased over time. One is because there's conflicting recommendations in terms of screening between societies, including both primary care and specialist societies. Um, and the second uh, of what I mentioned that perhaps we're over-treating uh, these older adults. And from this large UK study of more than 50,000 adults, you can see that the majority of thyroid hormone initiation prescriptions occurred in this mildly elevated TSH level. Um, again, indicating that perhaps we're becoming a little bit too aggressive uh, in these patients. And then of course, you know, I don't have the data to show here due to time, but there's definitely an influence of social media um, in terms of thyroid hormone being the solution to everybody's problems. Um, so initially when I started being interested in this, we, uh, we conducted a, a physician survey because I was interested in part to know 
why are physicians prescribing thyroid hormone in their patients? So this was a nationwide physician survey targeting primary care physicians, both internists and family practice, as well as endocrinologists. And unfortunately, I was not able to get um, to get access to geriatricians at that time. But one of the interesting findings though, was that you can see, even though many physicians stated that they use thyroid hormone for appropriate indications, which are hypothyroidism and thyroid cancer in patients who may have had some or all of their thyroid out, there's a number of physicians that use or initiate thyroid hormone for controversial indications. And for those of you who do treat these patients, you may have seen this um, where thyroid hormone may be started in patients who have normal thyroid function tests to um, help with weight loss or fatigue or other symptoms. But what was disturbing is that about one fourth of these physicians stated that they use thyroid hormone to suppress growth of thyroid nodules uh, in patients who have normal thyroid function tests. And this practice has actually been advocated uh, against uh, in guidelines since the mid 90s, because even though this practice may induce modest reduction in growth of thyroid nodules, it can uh, cause a significant risk with iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. Uh, on the right here, and in the interest of time, I won't go through this in detail, but you can see the physician characteristics that were associated with higher likelihood of doing this, uh, giving us also uh, a target in terms of intervention in the future. So subsequently, when thinking about the increase in thyroid hormone use and misuse, I wanted to further investigate the risks of not appropriately treating with thyroid hormone, because we have a lot of data uh, showing us that being hypothyroid or hyperthyroid endogenously uh, is associated with cardiovascular or skeletal adverse effects. But there were not good data in terms of us administering thyroid hormone and under or overshooting, maybe not always on purpose, whether that pertained any risk to our patients. Um, um, and you can see here, so one of the main reasons is that we know that the levels of free hormones in our blood are not the same when you have an endogenous dysfunction versus when somebody is being over or under treated. We are not very good at treating uh, with thyroid hormone. You can see here a summary of several studies that shows that suboptimal therapy is quite common with overtreatment being reported in as, as high as almost 50% of patients uh, here in the Framingham Heart Study and under treatment as high as in one third of the patients. Um, in the interest of time, I wanted to go over two of the studies that we did uh, that looked at uh, cardiovascular outcomes, um, mainly stroke and cardiovascular mortality. But some of our other studies have also shown an effect of thyroid hormone overtreatment on bone. Because my K was focused on using VA data to look at the association between thyroid hormone and bone, and we had a rich database of many patients on thyroid hormone therapy, uh, we used this, uh, the corporate data warehouse um, to determine these associations uh, between 2004 and 2017. You can see here the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. Um, we decided to do this longitudinally because all the past studies were cross-sectional and we wanted to see whether there's an effect, you know, as TSH or as the biochemical markers vary over time uh, because many patients do have multiple adjustments in their dose um, with fluctuation in their labs indicating um, euthyroidism or over or under treatment. We excluded patients with thyroid cancer because this patient, in some of these patients, we intentionally uh, induce hyperthyroidism to keep the thyroid cancer dormant. And we also excluded patients uh, who were on medications uh, that may interfere with thyroid function tests. All of the biochemical evaluations we used were in the outpatient setting uh, because critical illness can also affect thyroid function tests. Um, and we looked at the main outcome we were interested in was incident stroke because there was no study that looked at this association before, but we also evaluated atrial fibrillation as we know it's a common mediator for stroke. So you can see here, these are sample sites. We had a, a large population of more than 700,000 uh, adults on thyroid hormone with a median follow-up of 59 months. 
um, with, uh, you can see there 11% with incident atrial fibrillation uh, in between thyroid hormone initiation and study conclusion or incident event, and 6.32 with stroke. Um, and as I mentioned, we used our exposure, exposure variables as time varying. We adjusted for uh, a comprehensive set of covariates, including demographics, smoking, as well as comorbidities that we knew were traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And when we did the analysis for stroke, we also adjusted for prior history of atrial fibrillation. And these are the important findings of this study that was published uh, two years ago now. On the top, you can see um, the uh, uh, risk of incident atrial fibrillation per TSH and free T4 category. And at the bottom, you can see the risk of incident stroke. And uh, you can see here uh, the ranges. So these are all compared to youth thyroid individuals. And definitely you can see a cumulative increase in risk in both atrial fibrillation and stroke in both patients who are over and under treated um, uh, in this population. So the conclusion is that perhaps thyroid hormone treatment intensity may be a modifiable risk factor for stroke. We actually, um, this, this finding persisted when we adjusted for atrial fibrillation and also results didn't change when the cohort was restricted to adults age 65 years and older uh, or uh, restricted to males. Similarly, we also looked at thyroid hormone treatment intensity and cardiovascular mortality. And we did this using uh, the same data set merged with the National Death Index uh, with similar inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we uh, determined the, uh, the cause of death uh, using uh, ICD-10 codes. So again, a large sample, uh, well-powered to detect um, this association with a median age of 67 years. And you can see about one third of patients died of some cause and about 11% died of a cardiovascular cause. Uh, and similarly running separate survival analyses to determine um, the association between TSH and free T4 measurements and cardiovascular mortality. So the main finding uh, in this study too was that when adjusting for traditional cardiovascular risk factors, both patients who were over and under treated had increased risk of cardiovascular mortality compared to the patients that were taking thyroid hormone with their uh, levels in the normal range. And you can see here uh, the, the forest plot that kind of looks at the different intervals of biochemical marker, um, having the uh, farther away of being with uh, from the youth thyroid range in both over and under treatment, uh, having increased risk of cardiovascular mortality in this population. So I've shown you so far that thyroid hormone use is common. Uh, we do often misuse thyroid hormone and also we're not great at uh, optimal thyroid hormone management. And we know that both over and under treatment have risks. So what factors influence our decision-making? This is difficult because there's many factors that can influence why we prescribe thyroid hormone or how we adjust it. And I wanted to plug this in, and this was a study that we did last year, um, uh, because this just kind of shows the difficulty physicians may have and how complex it may be to manage thyroid hormone in older adults with comorbidities and polypharmacy. So in this sample of more than a half a million uh, older adults on thyroid hormone, we found that one third uh, were also on medications that are known to interfere with thyroid hormone metabolism. Um, uh, and, and we uh, we actually saw a strong association of these in women, Blacks, and Hispanics. And this is consistent with prior studies that have shown polypharmacy and initiation of potentially inappropriate medications in uh, women and minorities. So uh, we surveyed physicians again and asked them a couple of other questions. You know, once you start thyroid hormone, how do you decide what target TSH you should follow? and whether patient age actually influences these targets based on the data I've shown you. Um, we were able uh, to, we used the modified Dillman method of survey administration that has multiple mailings, uh, reminders, and an incentive. 
So you can see here the most commonly physician reported factor influencing decision making as to what goal TSH to target were patient symptoms. Uh, about 70% of physicians uh, noted that with uh, cardiovascular concerns ranking higher than skeletal concerns. Um, uh, and patient age being reported as a factor uh, in a little bit over 50% of physicians' decision-making. Um, and you can see here, when we looked at the, um, the physician characteristics associated with placing importance on patient age, and again, we weren't able to survey geriatricians in this survey, um, you can see that endocrinologists were more likely to place importance of patient age uh, when, when targeting certain goals um, in their patients um, and similar to internists compared to family practitioners, uh, even though you can see the percentage here is much higher for endocrinologists. And then typically patients, uh, sorry, physicians with higher, higher patient volume were more likely um, to place importance on patient age. Um, and this is kind of an outline, a graphic outline of uh, when we had presented physicians with different scenarios that uh, varied in gender and age. Uh, but you, what you can see here, the good thing is that at least in this physician cohort, most of them do not target um, a range in the over-treatment um, category. And when you see the yellow line, uh, the majority of physicians tried to target a higher TSH range in those patients who are in their 80s. So this is possibly an attempt on the physician side to try to avoid overtreatment in this population. There's many barriers as to why appropriate thyroid hormone management is not um, happening. Um, and so this was, a, this was a more recent survey that we did where we, uh, we were actually lucky to get uh, American Geriatric Society physicians to participate in addition to family practitioners and endocrine, uh, endocrinologists. Um, and we wanted, among other things, to know what barriers could we address or what barriers are modifiable in terms of improving um, thyroid hormone management in our patient population and avoiding patient harm. Oh, sorry. Maria? Um, yes. You're pausing. Um, you have about five minutes left, okay. including question time. Um, okay. So feel free to use I it will. all or okay. Pause okay, I'll more. try to, to move a bit faster. Thank you. Yep. Um, so these are the most common physician reported barriers. Um, and you can see here patient non-adherence was actually the most common reported barrier. But what was interesting to see is that patients request for tests and treatments was something that was reported by physicians as uh, making it difficult to appropriately man manage thyroid hormone. And the physicians who reported patient requests as a barrier were also more likely to report concern for patient dissatisfaction. Um, other important things to see, multiple provide providers managing thyroid hormone was a barrier. So it may suggest that better physician to physician communication uh, is important. So I'll move on here. Um, and these are the specific patient requests uh, that the physicians reported um, that acted as barriers. And you can read here, but all of these are unconventional uh, or inappropriate, including here the patient requesting that they are maintained over-treated. Um, and the red bars, you can see the physician report of them executing those patient requests. So I'm going to end here. Um, uh, with this slide, but, but the next steps um, are really to try to figure out an intervention to reduce this low value thyroid hormone, particularly in older adults to avoid harm. And I'm focusing in the context of thyroid hormone overtreatment and misuse. Uh, we currently have funding from the USC Prescribing Research Network to conduct qualitative work to better understand uh, both physician and patient factors involved in the decision to deprescribe. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much. I know it's tough to fit yes. all your work <laughs> into 20 minutes. Um, we appreciate that. I, there was one question in the chat that came through ahead of time. If you uh, can see it or do, would you like me to read it out? No, yeah, I can see it. So the question is, if one has taken Synthroid for over 40 years and regularly tests for thyroid levels, is there some point at which the efficacy wanes? So... 
So not really, um, but older adults, we know that, so we know that the thyroid hormone dose is weight-based, uh, but truly is based on lean body mass. So we know that a lot of the older adults lose lean body mass uh, or have sarcopenia, uh, but also the creatinine clearance decreases. So typically older adults tend to require less thyroid hormone um, than younger individuals, but the efficacy doesn't really change per se, if that makes sense. Oh, Justine has a question. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we've had lots of conversations. Yes. About <laughs> I think where I know, and I'm, I'm counting on you to do this, what, what we get in the trap of is um, we see the TSH in the range that we think is appropriate, and then it's time for their one-year refill, and we refill it. And so, but we don't have any guidelines for de-escalation right now. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I yeah. would have to de-escalate if I knew. Yeah. How so to. there's, sure. So that, so, so I think one of the things, so the last hypothyroidism guidelines were in 2014. So it's almost a decade ago. Um, and the, based on expert opinion, the, those guidelines advocated that patients who are 70 years or older, the TSH, TSH target should be between four and six. So maintaining these people higher um, than your normal individual. Um, there's a lot of arguments that we should have age-specific TSH ranges, just like we have, for example, pregnancy-specific you know, uh, labs. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time, but yes, you know, I do have an R01 that's getting reviewed soon. Um, that's looking to um, figure out some, you know, some of those questions in terms of how do we, uh, how, how do we make this easier um, and more maybe regimented uh, for physicians and how do we make it so there's no, um, you know, it, it's hard because we're all, you know, there's time constraints, right? And how do we make it in a way that is kind of a multi-level system, uh, a multi-level intervention where it takes away from the burden from the physician, but there is some kind of guidance. So I we'll see. Thanks. Well, and I guess in the last minute, I didn't see other questions. So I'll just ask you a quick question, which kind of builds on Justine's question. Um, and you and I have talked about this too, but um, you know, you've got to do education on the provider level, but then also a lot of the times um, patients are used to taking things, right? And so how do you, you know, just maybe say a bit about what you think needs to be done at the patient level to kind of educate um, and, and have in, increased patient acceptance of kind of this deep prescribing. Yeah. It's, it's a loaded question, as you know. I know. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, and, it, so, and, and I didn't have time to talk about the qualitative interview. So we've done qualitative interviews with physicians and we did focus groups with patients to kind of guide us as to what um, their perspective is. And I think the majority of patients, once you explain the evidence and educate them, uh, they're on board, but there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that are involved, right? There's physician inertia is a big one, and then the physician patient trust. So um, that can, you know, as themes out of this. So I think I think having some kind of a simple um, simple patient education material, in addition to the physician um, guidance. Um, together uh, may help. Yeah, um, I look forward to hopefully working with you on some of that in the future because I think it, it is really important and multi level. Um, so. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we're going to turn it over to Dr. Wu um, if she wants to go ahead and share her slides. And then we'll, um, I'll also keep track of time. And, and give you a little heads up there, Justine. Thank you. Okay, does it look good? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Holly, for this opportunity. And um, I'm delighted to follow after my close colleague here and share the spotlight. Okay, I have no financial or personal conflicts of interest. Just wanna take a pause and acknowledge that our institution sits on the ancestral 
Um, and often we forget the present lands of the Anishinaabe nation that has persisted despite broken treaties and systemic attempts at erasure. The Anishinaabe nation actually um, exists on the lands of Michigan, extends into Ohio, into Canada and the Great Lakes. And it consists of a long um, relationship um, in union between three groups, the Ojibwa, the Potawatomi, Potawatomi nations, and the Odawa nations, as well as the Wyandotte nation. And I learned recently that there's, if you wanna learn more, there's actually a Michigan History Museum that showcases uh, this history in Lansing. I have so many um, people to thank, including many funders, as well as I just wanna highlight the internal funds from Michigan have been invaluable, including from my own department, Mishar and more. Want to thank the village that got me here. Um, I'm at the end of my K going into R01 stage, and um, in particular, my project coordinator, Murphy Van Sparentak, who is here today. And at the risk of um, naming people, when you name people, you always risk missing somebody. But I do think the mentors here, I will name out loud, who have um, just um, helped me along the way, really question my research question and my process to make it as rigorous and as impactful as possible. So Caroline Richardson, Mike Fetters, Ananda Sen, Brian Zickman Fisher, James Akins, Sherry Scheinfeld Gorin, Lori Buis, Laura Dam Schroeder, and John Creswell, and many more. So this is gonna be a, a slightly different talk. I am going to be talking very little, just alluding to my data findings and focus on process. For me, the last five years has much been more about working and figuring out how to do things <laughs> and um, reaching these challenges, which I'm reframing as pivots because there's always gonna be challenges and it's just learning how to work around or change the goal. And that was probably the most valuable thing I've learned from the five years of the K activities. So I'll go over my project and my aims and also um, talk a little bit about behavioral intervention models that have guided me. And I'm just gonna hone in on three lessons I've learned. One is the trials and tribulations of developing a web-based tool. And I know Dr. Holly has a lot of expertise in this. I would love to hear some of your feedback at the end. And, and specifically a contraceptive decision tool. Lesson two was conducting a, an in quotes pilot study and um, the, the scope of the pilot study and what I said I was going to do and what I ended up doing. Lesson three was navigating the tension of integrating social justice frameworks into traditional um, NIH grants that don't necessarily align along um, or are looking for that um, to be incorporated into the design. So the problem at a population level is that chronic conditions we know are rising and they are the fasting rises, fastest rising cause of pregnancy related death and injury, in particular diabetes, high blood pressure, high blood pressure and then rising rapidly as substance use disorder. Contraception has been long known to be a cornerstone prevention of unplanned pregnancy and its related complications. And contraceptive non-use, which is defined as not using any method despite not wanting to become pregnant, poses the greatest risk of unplanned pregnancy in any moment. And while there's been a big push for highly effective contraceptive methods most recently, like 99% effective, we know that the use of any method, including condoms, pull out, over-the-counter methods greatly reduces the risk of unplanned pregnancy and saves cost no matter what the method is. So you look at two public health issues here, unplanned pregnancy and contraceptive non-use, and they are both more prevalent in people with chronic conditions and chronic disease, and even more so among those who have conditions that preclude the safe use of combined hormonal methods, which include estrogen and progestin. The patient level issue is 
it's hard to choose birth control, even in the absence of having chronic disease. It's a highly preference sensitive decision and that there are more than one acceptable option and that the best option really should be based upon the person's personal values and um, unique medical situation. There are 18 different categories right now in the US. We've had an explosion of new devices in particular in the last 10 years. And within each method category, there are now subcategories to consider. So for example, if you're interested in intrauterine device, it's not just one, but um, two and potentially five that you have to think about depending upon its mechanism of action. And the other thing is each method has a unique attribute. Is it permanent? Is it reversible? How does it affect your menses? What side effects? How do you use it? How is it administered? And on and on. For people who have chronic disease or chronic conditions, they have unique additional factors. Will the method potentially positively impact their condition or negatively impact their condition? For example, if you have fibroids and you have heavy bleeding, the hormonal IUD is actually a medical treatment for that. In contrast, if you have liver disease, using estrogen-containing methods could accelerate disease. So there's both absolute and relative contraindications. And there are some, not many, but there are some drug interactions to consider, such as anti-epileptic medications, which are being used increasingly for things beyond ep epilepsy, such as um, headaches, uh, pain management, um, and mental health. So to sort through all of this, we do have good data that shows that patients do value their clinician's advice. And however, they don't want it to be directive. They want to be informed of their options and a range of options, and they want to be involved in that decision. PCP barriers, and I'm focusing on primary care physicians as I am a primary care physician, and a lot of the work that's been done in this space has focused on um, um, obstetrician gynecologists or family planning specialists. So PCPs who provide contraception and um, in family medicine, contraceptive care is a required training. <clears throat> PCPs also are trained in chronic disease, so they're uniquely situated to counsel patients. The barriers are not unexpected. It's time, but it's specifically time to elicit their preferences and then educate about all the options in the face of competing preventive, acute, and chronic care demands. And then finally, while there are tools out there, they are underutilized and awareness is low. So the need or the gap, I'm addressing this on two, level, uh, two levels. On the patient levels, they need to understand, be able to compare their options and then make an informed choice in the context of not just their personal priorities, but their chronic disease. And on the PCP level, it's a, manage, it's a management of time and knowledge, very common um, issues. What's been done so far is we do have some contraceptive decision tools that have been tested, piloted, and trialed in RCTs. They have generally targeted adolescents or people without chronic conditions. We have really mixed results regarding contraceptive outcomes, but promising findings with respect to person-centered care measures. On the provider level, the CDC has worked really hard in disseminating contraceptive guidelines to counsel people about contraception in the setting of medical conditions. They're evidence-based, publicly available, routinely updated, and there is a phone app for that. So the proposed solution is to address both the patient and provider side and to develop a decision tool that addresses the contraceptive information needs of the patient. So it's primarily a patient-facing tool, but to pull that PCP in and um, give them some point of care clinical resource and facilitate that interactive discussion and ideally a shared decision-making process. So this was a mixed methods multi-phase study and aim one, it's we need to understand on the patient, provider, and the practice level, what's relevant that we need to know to design and implement this tool in primary care. Aim two is to take these uh, as qualitative and quantitative findings and inform the development of the tool, again, for use in the primary care setting. And aim three was to pilot this in community-based primary care settings in preparation for the future R01 RCT, which I have now submitted and resubmitted, and I'm waiting for the final results in a week. 
So this is a more granular view of the actual mixed methods design, but I want you to just pay attention to the red, which is what I proposed for sample size. So in AIM-1, which was needs assessment, you know, we, we did qualitative, quantitative surveys, field practices, and we, for the most part, did it. We use that beta data to build, that qualitative data to build the decision tool, and we did that. And then we need to move to the RCT, which we did, but pay attention to the numbers there, 240 women, four to six practices, four to six pra uh, focus groups. We're gonna do audio tape transcripts and we did not much of that. So um, this is a lesson in pilot studies. Now, um, uh, there's a conceptual model that um, we proposed and we refined and um, happy to say, I'm finally at the, the stage here that um, I proposed like seven years ago. So I wanna step back and talk about what models we have for um, anchoring our behavioral intervention um, research. We're familiar with this traditional drug development research model, which starts from phase zero, which is preclinical exploratory animal studies and moving to phase four, where you're looking at safety and dosing and PK studies, efficacy versus effectiveness, and finally post-marketing surveillance. It's really difficult to apply this model to non-pharmaceutical research, translational work, and particularly, I found it difficult to think about it as far as behavioral interventions. So I was very fortunate and to attend the NIH Summer Institute Behavioral Clinical Trials um, two summers ago. And if anyone was interested in behavioral design, I highly, highly recommend this one week course. And there's where I was introduced to the orbit model. And it layers upon the drug research model, but it's a little bit more refined for what I was doing, so I used it. So it starts with making sure you have a good clinical question. And so therefore AIM-1 was asking people if this is something that was necessary and developing that conceptual model. Then you take that and we move into phase one, which is design. And there you're looking at defining what features of the intervention are important and then refining them. And this is where we work with the professional design team. Now we're what we call go live. We've now launched it and we wanna do some prototype testing, cognitive testing, and that's where um, we move into phase two, and I would call this proof of concept. After we've done some tinkering around, we're now ready to do the pilot, which was AIM-3, a feasibility pilot, at which point you're doing quasi-experimental trials, really focusing on feasibility. You might be looking for some positive signals at this point. If that still seems like it's feasible, um, and you can conduct a trial. I'm now at this point where we're proposing an R1 um, level trial, a cluster RCT, and that would be phase C here, phase two efficacy trial, where you're now bringing in the comparator. You're trying to find clinically significant findings over noise at this point. And, um, you know, if, if everything looks good, and this is a lot of ifs, you may be able to move into effectiveness research, phase four, where we'd be looking at implementation trials in uh, broader settings. And I will say that I did entertain, and there was a lot of discussion about doing a hybrid implementation efficacy trial. And ultimately, it um, felt more um, confusing and expensive and, um, um, scary, I think, at the point, because I did not feel the confidence that we have an evidence-based um, tool to go forth there. So I have implementation built into the trial, but I'm not selling it as an implementation hybrid trial at this moment. So lesson one, building a web-based decision tool. Just so we're anchored in the same definition, a decision support tool is really there to inform people about their options, compare them, simplify what can be a really complex decision, reduce any tension or uncertainty in their decision, which we refer to as decisional conflict, and ideally promote shared decision-making. So when I first started this, the first thing I had to do was find somebody to design this with me. And so after many interviews, expert consultations, we finally landed on a small company in Ann Arbor, a startup group that at the time I felt it was really important to have face-to-face -face meetings. This is pre-COVID. 
So we felt happy with this group, but in the process of interviewing different startup companies, I heard the same thing, which is we do user-centered design. We're agile, we iterate, we customize, we'll do what you need. And so as much as I tried to discern at that moment, well, can you really do what I need? It was also hard because I didn't know what I needed necessarily until I started diving in. So what became uh, what I thought was gonna be a six month process, one year process became a two year process from beginning to end. And it sounded something like this, which was the research team would say, we had done all these great interviews and the participants could benefit from this feature. Can we just go ahead and add that? And then the design team would turn around and say, sure. And then it would become, wah, 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 where is all this technical talk? And they would say, but give us six weeks and like $10,000 more. And then we're like, no, we can't do that. We're already spending 70K. We don't even know that this works. So what we had to learn to do, the challenge was, excuse me, go back. The challenge really was, what do I need to maintain fidelity to the core components of this intervention and let everything else go? And to not put blame on the team, this was a very complex question that was hard to simplify into code and algorithms. As a reminder, we're dealing with patient provider facing platforms. We have 18 different methods. We're dealing with over 40 different situations and conditions. So we had to pivot and identify and operationalize what are the common points of decisions, like breaking points at which people um, can converge upon and write common content for those pathways. So as an example, a very common easy decision point was um, menses. I absolutely cannot live with not having my menses. And so therefore that path would take them down to only methods which um, would still maintain menses or um, all the people who couldn't take estrogen. There are people with diabetes and complications, et cetera. They could unite on that pathway. So we only showed them estrogen free methods. So those were the things we had to take time to do. And we had to manually, in fact, Murphy manually programmed all of this content ourselves on the back end and the wireframe. Uh, it's clunky, but it was good enough. And I just kind of keep repeating to myself, this is a prototype. It's a what they would call a minimal viable product. And that's good enough for now. Justine, I'm so, um, I, I'm, <laughs> I love this slide. I'm gonna uh, ask you if I can borrow it sometime, but you have about five minutes, including questions to leave a few at the end for joint questions. Oh, cool. all right. I think I can do this. So essentially the critical, um, there's a critical decision point. Um, I did make two good decisions. One is I didn't, I built a new tool. I didn't layer upon previous ones. Um, I looked at other ones and I had to trust that our pre-designed data indicated the need for a unique tool. And the second one, I'm only going to say a quick thing about it. It's a little uh, techie, but we decided to build a tool that was mobile optimized and not a native phone app. The native phone app um, has to is is just more complicated, more expensive. So we built a tool that could be flexible to turn into a uh, mobile uh, app later or not. Um, I can't believe how the time flew by. Let's keep going here. So I'm going to just quickly show some shots of the patient interface quickly show some shots of the clinician interface and then get into lesson number three. What's a pilot study? So I wish I'd known this when I was writing the K-23, but when I asked, people had many opinions. And so if you recall what I initially proposed, which is 240 people, five to six sites, you know, I, um, and I did power calculations. So I um, would have scaled it back and this is the definition that resonates most with me. And I think um, a lot of the folks that I learned from at the Summer Institute is that a pilot study is really evaluation of feasibility of your process. Can you randomize? Can you retain? Are your survey methods and the, um, and the tools acceptable, understandable? Um, can you actually do this in primary care was the question I had to ask. And it's not about hypothesis testing. And because your sample size is typically very small, you even if you get, um, positive findings, they're very unstable. So you have to be cautious about um, determining your effect size based upon a pilot study. So pivots, you know, I said I would do this big study. 
And um, I had pitfalls. The design was inappropriate. And individual randomization is not appropriate for this kind of uh, design where we're interacting with the patient and the provider. So a cluster randomization by practice was more appropriate, which is what we ended up doing. Very premature goals that were efficacy-based versus feasibility. And it also wasn't practical because it was hard to get clinics to commit, uh, especially during the pandemic, which we didn't anticipate. Um, and what I actually did was a straightforward one arm pilot of the decision tool early only. I didn't want to do usual care because I wanted to spend my time to get as much patient interaction on that data and provider interaction so I can have a lot of experiences combined and help inform the next step. We ended up with two out of six practices that originally said they would help out. And that's that's life. Um, and then we did do some social media recruitment to boost our numbers, and we ended up with 67 patients. Um, the bright spot is I learned so much. We learned from our quote unquote failures, and we actually have good feasibility data to justify moving on. I'm just highlighting here that patients um, sort of quantitatively rated it highly as far as recommendations to others, that they rated it easy to use. And then I felt this quotation really helped capture the essence of it, was that it helped this person who's introverted talk to their doctor whom they're not comfortable with, um, help with time management for the patient too, not just the doctor. She says cramming things into a half hour is hard. And it also gave her confidence in actually speaking for, her, um, for herself and her priorities. I'm gonna keep moving here. Last lesson is integrating social justice frameworks. And um, you know, this is just speaking to the tension of wanting to integrate reproductive justice into this um, and um, not knowing how to negotiate that in an NIH application where priority scores are not driven by health equity outcomes necessarily. Although we are seeing that change with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and PCORI moving more towards that process of health equity outcomes. So what I didn't show the reviewers was this framework of a reproductive justice framework and how I thought I was going to infuse that throughout the study. And the goal really was that we didn't wanna promote sanction or normalize contraceptive or reproductive coercion because others, including ourselves, found in our data, particularly from black women, poor women, and young women that clinicians can and have, whether unconsciously or consciously, prevent fully informed decisions or coerce contraceptive use. The most common example is, here's an IUD, it's gonna be great for you, and I'm gonna tell you all the reasons why you should have this, and limiting the number of options they discuss and directing them to the option that they think is best for them. The most egregious acts of contraceptive coercion occurred as well too, where women would come and have an IUD place or an implant, be very unhappy with it for very legitimate reasons. And the physician would refuse to remove, remove it and uh, based upon um, sort of a paternalistic um, recommendation that, you know, what's best for you to hang in, it'll get better and you certainly don't wanna get pregnant right now. So what we did was we built in a contraceptive bill of rights and we just embedded this into the tool to encourage people to review what their rights are as a patient. And also because we don't have the confidence, we don't know which provider they're seeing, we don't have control over that, um, to just give them that. So we figured we can leverage the patient and have them understand that they actually can get a second opinion and it's okay to say no and not choose anything that day. And we consistently in our cognitive interviews, this is probably the one thing everybody consistently liked. And they felt it was relevant and they felt it was empowering. This patient said here, it makes you feel like you have a sense of agency. Um, you have the freedom to decide what's best for you. Um, and you don't have to feel pressured into anything by anyone. <clears throat> the biggest challenge for us was engaging and recruiting BIPOC patients, those who we thought we wanted that needed the tool the most. We only had a couple of practices. They had um, not very diverse patient demographics, some of them being in Michigan, and we just didn't have the money to give clinics to support all the research activities we were asking them to do. 
So the pivot really is going to be in the R1 phase where we've partnered with a large national um, research network who has established relationships and trust built up with other clinics across the country that our small team does not. Um, and this includes some federally qualified health centers. And the second thing was to really think about the cost of clinics time and to fight hard for it in the budget. In my first version of the R01, I asked for $20,000 per clinic for a year and a half of engagement. And I still thought that wasn't enough. And they came back and said, that's way too much. And so I had to be very detailed and break down every single activity and how many hours I thought, actually, I knew it would take based upon our pilot. So hopefully that is convincing on this time around. And finally, the pivot I have to be prepared for is that this may not be the right tool to reach historically marginalized populations. And if that ends up being the case, then we got to stop and um, pivot and think about working from the ground out ground up, for, excuse me, ground up for community generated solutions and be prepared to let go of that. And finally, the, the best pivot I'll end on is that in this work and frustrations with working with slow research, myself and my colleague, um, Paul Janana Puma, who is on the call right now, we talked to other colleagues and we um, decided we wanted to create a mechanism for addressing anti-racism and health equity systematically in our work regardless of what content area we are working in. So we're a small program, we're getting our legs and we have a mission of exposing um, and addressing health inequities um, caused by racism and intersecting forms of oppression through our scholarship. And right now we are definitely seeking partners across the um, university departments and programs. So please do check out our website if you get a chance. And I'm just gonna end on acknowledging MLK Kay's birthday um, and taking some wisdom from his I had a dream speech, which I heard for the first time in its entire T this week. Um, and he says, there's no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. So we have a rising tide of energy and money going into health equity. And I think researchers should be ready to, to ride that. Thank you so much for your time and happy to take some questions now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't know if I was muted or not still. Uh, we have a minute <laughs> for questions. Um, let's have Emily ask her question. Um, Emily, do you want to? ask it or I can ask it on your behalf. If you're there, go for it. Sure, I am here. Um, thank you so much for both of your presentations. That was really inspiring. And um, I help lead the Workforce Diversity and Health Equity Initiative for IHPI. And we're just always thinking about how IHPI's role with health equity. So I just wondered if you'd be willing to comment on how IHPI can best support you in your work as a health equity researcher. I thought, and I was hoping someone would ask that question. <laughs> we have some specific programs we're ready to launch, but we don't have infrastructure. And one of them would be to host a um, speaker series that focus on junior BIPOC researchers or those focusing on anti-racism. So that's one way to elevate those um, that work. But the other way is really to work systematically on training ourselves, which we are actively doing all the time because we're not experts. But what are some of the, um, um, th uh, theories and approaches that we can use to ensure we integrate it. These process from the beginning, from the question we ask to how we um, collect our data, to whom we involved, to how we disseminate. And that's, that's why we need help. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's helpful. And all. Yeah, but we should connect off. Yeah. I would love to. Thanks. Thank you both, Maria and Justine. Um, great presentations, lots to think about. And I, you know, we go into um, for those who want to stay on. Stacy will put us into some smaller breakout rooms so we can continue some conversations. So please feel free to do that, and also feel free to contact our speakers or us if you have any questions, and we can get those to them. Um, really great, great to have two amazing presentations in one seminar very invigorating. Thank you both.